Imagine, demand, and build a world transformed. Okay, I think we'll get started um, just um, for those who are on time. <laughs> it's unfair to make you wait. wait. Um, thanks so much for coming. Um, it's been an exciting day for Scottish Labour today, uh, but we won't be talking about that. We'll be talking about much more important things. Uh, my name is Diamond Callagher. Um, I'm one of the organisers involved in Glasgow Transformed, which is a spin-off from the World Transformed. As I'm sure most of you are aware, this event is part of the World Transformed's uh, TWT20 event. Um, the day of events today, um, organised by local groups, uh, which I think is a fantastic, fantastic initiative, and I'm really pleased that the World Transformed has done that and given support for the local groups to organise these events. Um, this event on um, community wealth building in Scotland is also part of a day, uh, part of a stream on um, socialist demands in the era of coronavirus. Um, and there's a whole set of really interesting events on that. Tomorrow there's another one on uh, COVID and the future of work. Later in the week there's a couple of great event looking events on the uh, Green New Deal. So I'd encourage people to go and look at that strand and I think that'll kind of link well into some of the discussions we'll have uh, tonight. Um, so as I said, this is part of um, Glasgow Transformed and we're a relatively new group that was set up this year um, and we're sort of just getting going really, but we've, we've had a couple of events. We, um, some of the group organized a reading group over the summer on um, prison abolition, which was uh, really fantastic. We did a joint event with our friends at Glasgow Labour for a Green New Deal a few weeks back, which was another good one. Um, and we're gonna be looking to organize more events in the future. So. If, people here are from Glasgow and they want to get involved uh, we're going to give some more information um, later in the event about how you can do that and um, okay that's for me and I'll pass over to Kim. Right, so um, hi everyone I'm Kim and I'm one of the organizers at Glasgow Transformed and um, so today's event is really about building community wealth in Scotland and this year North Ayrshire Council launched Scotland's first community wealth building program and I think it's safe to say that this is one of the most exciting initiatives being undertaken by the Labour Party in Scotland. Um, and as activists, you know, throughout so many of our discussions in the past number of years, and um, whether that's been through various elections or organising for the Green New Deal, we come back time and time again to democratic ownership, which is one of the underpinning features um, of what's happening in North Ayrshire. And that's really, what sparked us wanting to run this political education session today and this session um, is really about holding a political education event where we can learn more and be really inspired by the ideas that are happening on the left and particularly in light of the health and economic and environmental crisis that we're facing. So this session will provide um, the opportunity to hear from experts in the area um, and from a range of different perspectives. Um, so we'll hear from our expert panel, first of all, and then we will have a Q&A section through the chat function. So to introduce our speakers, we have three speakers today who um, we're really grateful to, um, who are able to join us. Um, so first up, we've got Grace Brown. Grace is a researcher at the University of Glasgow and she's researching municipal ownership. And prior to this, Grace was a researcher at the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. So Grace is going to be giving us a bit of background to the concept um, and really giving us that introduction. Then we've got Joe Cullinane, who is a Labour councillor and leader of North Ayrshire Council and responsibilities include the community wealth building and he's also a member of the Scottish Labour Shadow Cabinet and Joe will be giving us um, a bit of background of what's happened in North Ayrshire and um, a lot of the exciting work that's gone into that. And then we have Rose Foyer, General Secretary of the STUC and is a member of North Ayrshire Council Community Wealth Building Panel. Um, in her role as General Secretary, um, this involves representing over half a million trade unionists across Scotland and we're really um, grateful for us joining today and we'll hear a bit about the trade union perspective of community wealth building and a wider Scotland view. So we'll hear from our speakers first, um, from Grace, followed by a Q&A in the chat box, so I'll hand over to Grace.
Brilliant, thanks Kim. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, as Kim mentioned, my name's Grace and I'm also um, an organiser with Glasgow Transformed. Um, and I am a PhD researcher at the University of Glasgow, where I'm at municipal ownership, um, economic democracy and political alternatives to neoliberalism. But again, as Kim said before that, I worked as a researcher for the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. Um, CLES are the National Organisation for Local Economies, uh, and they've really been spearheading the community wealth building movement in the UK for over a decade now. Um, the most notable example of this is probably Preston, which has been dubbed the Preston model, uh, but CLES work all across all four countries of the UK at really progressing this movement. Um, so yeah, before we hear from Joe and Ros later this evening, I thought I would begin by giving a brief introduction to what community wealth building is. Um, but before that, I think it's useful to set the scene as to where the movement has emerged from, um, and that is the current economic system. So, the, you know, the current model is very growth oriented, it's highly extractive, and it's based on the idea that once wealth and prosperity is reached at the top, it will eventually trickle down. Um, but we know that that has led to stark inequalities, um, huge environmental damage, amongst a whole host of other sort of social ills. Um, in Scotland, this looks like a quarter of children living in poverty and 65% of these children being from a household where someone is actually in work. Um, it looks like huge inequality in terms of wealth. So 41.5% of wealth is owned by just 10% of the Scottish population. Um, a quarter of the Scottish population actually have just 500 pound in savings and a further 7% either have no savings or are in debt. Um, and this inequality also manifests itself in the form of highly concentrated land ownership. So 57% of Scotland's rural land is in private hands. Um, only about 12.5% is owned by public bodies and just 3% is owned by the community. Um, and of course, all of this was true even before the coronavirus pandemic, uh, but COVID has obviously brought with it the sort of very daunting prospect of mass unemployment, mass eviction, you know, a, a global recession. Um, but it also has really revealed the extent to which our public services have really been degraded over the last sort of four decades of underinvestment, uh, privatisation, austerity. Um, and as well as this, the pandemic has really shown the extent to which profit sort of functions almost entirely removed from our communities. You know, over the last few months, small businesses have gone bankrupt or had to like lay off staff, while at the same time, corporations like Amazon have hired 100,000 new staff and the CEO of Amazon's personal wealth has ballooned and he's now on track to become the world's first trillionaire. Um, but as well as sort of highlighting these glaring issues within the system, the pandemic has also really underscored the centrality of community to our everyday lives. You know, it's been at the local level that response to the pandemic has been best, either through the sort of self-organized mutual aid networks or individual local authority action. Um, and it's at this local level that community wealth building is really most concerned. So community wealth building seeks to combat extraction through a reorganization of the economy based on asking sort of very fundamentally different questions about wealth. So these questions are who produces wealth, uh, where does it go and how can it be retained? And this approach seems to, aims to shift the dial on economic development strategies by building much more collaborative, inclusive, and fundamentally more democratically controlled local economies. Um, and to do this, a community wealth building approach harnesses the power of anchor institutions. Um, anchor institutions are generally large, uh, not profit oriented organizations who employ a lot of people and spend a lot of money and are tied to the place in which they're based. So examples of this would be hospitals or local councils or universities. Um, and community wealth building aims to work with these types of institutions across five pillars to ensure that the wealth, uh, employment practices and land and assets of these organisations can be better channeled in much more socially generative ways to benef better benefit the communities that they serve. Um, so the first of these pillars relates to procurement. So as mentioned, um, anchor institutions have a huge spending power. So the public sector in Ayrshire alone actually spends around a billion pound a year just on procuring goods and services, which I'm sure Joe will talk through more in, uh, shortly. Um, and so by advocating for really progressive procurement practices in this area, this spending power can be harnessed and channeled to benefit communities and retain this wealth in the local economy. 
Um, so one way that this can be done is through breaking down contracts so that small firms can actually, you know, stand a chance in competing for them, or it could be by figuring social value as part of the tendering process, um, all of which aims to develop like really dense local supply chains with a particular focus on plural forms of business ownership. So that would be cooperatives or employee owned businesses or social enterprises, you know, really like socially rooted businesses who tend to have better employment practices than the sort of multinational firms. Um, the second pillar then relates to employment. And this pillar is about working with large anchor institutions and their human resources departments to encourage them to pay the living wage or adopt more inclusive employment practices. So that might be um, like recruiting from lower income areas or building secure progression routes for workers, ensuring stable employment contracts and reliable hours. Um, and anchor institutions can also work to pressure or encourage businesses which are part of their supply chains to adopt these progressive practices too. And in that way, transform the wider local labor market as a whole. Uh, this was done quite successfully in Preston, where 4,000 extra employees now receive the real living wage than they did previous, prior to community wealth building. Um, the third pillar is around finance. So if we need to sort of rapidly increase the flows of investment within and to local economies, uh, a good way to achieve this could be through reorienting uh, like local authority pension funds to local schemes and creating or harnessing the power of mutually owned banks to grow local markets so that investment can be channeled towards local communities. Um, there's some really interesting research that's been published recently by Commonwealth uh, and they recommend that in order to alleviate the financing gap for alternative business models in Scotland, uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank could potentially steer financing to public and private bodies that serve a social and environmental purpose. Um, this would sort of really shift the traditional focus of, you know, maximising returns and shareholder profits, etc., to tackling the key challenges that face us as a society today. Um, and then the fourth pillar relates to the socially productive use of land and property. So I think it can be said that land ownership is really a key site of power in our society, um, and its concentration in very small hands. Um, is a real source of inequality and it fuels this sort of very extractive system of rentier capitalism that we're all so familiar with. Um, in a community wealth building approach, the function and ownership of these landed property assets held by anchor institutions is deepened to ensure that any financial gain is harnessed by local people and communities rather than enclosed simply by private interests. Um, what I think is important here is that the goal isn't just for local authorities to increase their stake in land ownership, but actually to reshape how and in whose interests land is held. So in this, it's notions of the commons being expanded to protect green spaces into, into sort of perpetuity, or it's um, identifying underutilised assets to transfer them into community land trusts, uh, all of which are ways which can deepen citizen participation uh, and retain and advance these community benefits. Um, so recently, it's a really interesting land commission has been announced in England. Um, the Liverpool City Region are actually going to be working with CLES to the very first, um, yeah, very first commission on public land for community wealth building, which I think offers like a lot of potential, which should be followed quite closely. Um, and then finally, the fifth pillar is about the plural ownership of the economy. So community wealth building seeks to promote locally owned and socially minded enterprises that enable wealth, which is created by users, workers and local communities to actually be held by them rather than flowing out as profits to shareholders. Um, so part of this is a focus on developing cooperatives or socially minded enterprises within the economy, um, which by their very nature, because they're much more rooted and very like related to the place that they're in, are much more locally generative. Um, so one interesting way that this could be done is through converting family-owned businesses uh, into more employee ownership forms, especially those types of businesses that don't really have like a succession plan or ideas of what they're going to do when it's like not in the family anymore. Um, so yeah, so those are the sort of five pillars of the community wealth building approach. But I think really at the heart of this approach is a real like restoration of the social fabric of our communities. You know, we can deepen the relationship between the production of wealth and those who benefit from it. We're really sort of changing how society would function. Um, so with that, I would like to pass on to Joe.
thanks for listening and I look forward to all your questions shortly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Grace. That was, a, that was such a good overview. Um, thank you, that was really good. Um, so we'll hand over to Joe just to say, as all of you will have seen just in the corner, we meant to say at the start that we're just recording um, this so that people who aren't able to make it can see it. So I just wanted to say that, but otherwise I'll hand over to Joe. Thank you uh, very much and thanks for uh, inviting me along to uh, speak tonight on what's I think becoming uh, one of the most important policy uh, sort of areas in uh, Scotland. And I think since we launched our community wealth building strategy in North Ayrshire there's certainly been a lot of interest uh, in what we're trying to do in North Ayrshire. Other councils have started to show some interest but there is also sort of interest at a national level too and Richard Leonard uh, recently gave a keynote speech and he's given uh, Community Wealth Build not only his, his full support, but he gave uh, a commitment that the Scottish Labour Party would support a Community Wealth Building Act to facilitate and enable other community wealth building initiatives to be rolled out across the country. And I think I would say that's the level of commitment we do need to see to this agenda, uh, because I think if we're going to discuss tonight the ambition to build community wealth in Scotland, then the intention must be to use community wealth building as a means of totally reorganising the economy for the bottom up, uh, to bring that uh, an end to that extractive uh, neoliberal economic model that's not working for people or planet and replace it with a more generative economy that does. And I have to say tonight that uh, I do have concerns that community wealth building will become just the latest sort of buzz term uh, in Scottish politics circles, people, not people talking tonight, but people in positions of power who will say they're doing community wealth building when they are not. And I'm hearing people arguing that uh, this agenda isn't political, that it should be a way of circumventing the role of local government or that it's a form of community empowerment. And all that will do is dilute the concept and affect the work of those of us who are committed to using it to change the economy. So I think all of us who see this as a transformational sort of policy and the potential of it uh, is to transform the Scottish economy. We need to be clear in setting out what we mean by community wealth building, what we want to achieve through it and how it should be implemented. And I think we should be prepared to call out those who do try and dilute it uh, for their own sort of purposes. I do want to try and sort of set out how we're going about doing that in North Ayrshire. I think fundamentally we're going to try and use in a very intentional uh, way the untapped economic power of the local state to design a new collaborative, inclusive, uh, sustainable and democratic local economy through the five pillars uh, that Grace has just spoke about. We're going to be using uh, the power of public procurement across Ayrshire to support uh, existing local supply chains, but also to create new ones. Uh, but I absolutely get that to achieve a democratic economy, we need to address the issue of ownership too, and that runs throughout everything that we have within our strategy. So we don't want to just settle for spending a bit more with some local businesses, we want to spend more with generative forms of businesses such as cooperative social enterprises, worker-owned businesses. And in procurement, as Grace was outlining, we do have considerable spending power that if we do use effectively, we can build and retain local wealth for our communities and people. Across the public sector, we do spend a, a billion pound a year procuring goods and services, and we need to use that in an intentional way to improve the economic and social conditions of our uh, region. So having mentioned that one billion pound figure, I think it is important to emphasise what Grace was saying about the need to take an anchor institution approach that has been successful in Preston. Yes, uh, North Ayrshire Council will be driving this agenda, both politically and operationally, but we're working with other public bodies, such as our health board, uh, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, to do the same. And Monday past, I actually just presented to the non-executive directors of the health board, and I emphasised to them that the health of the population is in intrinsically linked with the economic and social conditions of the region. And therefore, if they, uh, they, therefore they need to, as a health board, make a greater contribution to uh, economic contribution to the region as a, as a whole. And my argument is that the NHS, uh, acting as an anchor institution, can take a public health approach through community wealth building, using it as a preventive approach that improves the economic and social conditions of the population, and thus, thus improving the health of the population. Procurement isn't the only uh, lever at our disposal. 
we do own huge swathes of land and tons of buildings and rather than seeing them as assets to be sold off, reduce it to manage reducing budgets as a result of austerity, we're going to try and raise our ambitions and use those assets for the common good and that does mean transferring ownership to the community through cooperatives. And I think this will also be fundamental to our ambitions to tackle climate change which we are embedding and linking with our community wealth building work. So on Tuesday just past, um, a cabinet met and agreed the Council's approach to economic recovery and renewal from COVID. And of course it will take a, a route through the five pillars of community wealth building, but it also has an uh, investment in a local Green New Deal approach too. And a key part of that will be using a £8.8 .8 million investment fund that I created in the budget uh, in February. That was funded through refinance and loans. And the intention is to invest that investment fund in things like municipally owned renewable energy generation, which then generate an, in an ongoing income uh, stream for the council, and also half a million pounds of investment in a tree planting programme. And I think if you look at the type of projects, then of course they will uh, look to use our land and assets in an intentional way that does build a fairer and greener economy coming out of the COVID crisis. I think we also need to be looking at the power uh, that we hold as employers to create a better economy. In North Ayrshire, the council is the biggest employer and across uh, Ayrshire, the NHS is. That means that we can target our recruitment policies towards those living in poverty and aim to lift them out of it. It means that we can offer training and modern apprenticeships to young people. It means we can offer opportunities for career progression. And importantly, we can ensure that we're setting the bar on pay in terms and conditions for the wider regional economy. Our approach to economic recovery and renewal has also created a new green jobs fund that's got £500,000 of funding in it. And we're also exploring how we can offer jobs and training opportunities for young people through the tree planting programme. So with the strategy launched back in May, we're now trying to challenge ourselves to put every investment, every policy decision through a community wealth building lens uh, in North Ayrshire. Spoken a few times already about ownership of the economy and our strategy includes a number of actions that will boost uh, generative ownership models. Uh, such as the transition of family-owned businesses that Grace spoke about, the vast majority of whom do not have succession plans in place and we want to convert them into employee ownership, uh, safeguarding the, the company but also providing long-term uh, employment. And again, in Tuesday's uh, economic approach paper, we also created a community wealth building business fund that's reframing existing funds and budgets that we have at our disposal. And we're going to use that to help facilitate the development of new cooperative social enterprises, eh, etc. I'm conscious of time, but I just want to talk about that last pillar that Grace had mentioned, which is financial power. And it's probably the one where we don't have as much control over ourselves, and it's probably a wee bit longer term in its aspirations as well. First of all, I want to mention the ambition to establish a community bank. That bank would be mutually owned by its customers and able to use those customers' deposits within the bank to create new finance that can then be invested in the economy eh, of the region it serves. We are eh, already advancing that ambition. We've held a number of discussions with some stakeholders over recent months, but it will require further work, not least because in order to get a license for the Bank England, we believe it probably needs to be a bank that serves at least a population size of the west of Scotland, and it will also require £20 million to capitalise it eh, with the Bank of England. But notwithstanding those challenges, the democratising people's money seems to me to be a fairly transformative idea, and we need to be building the case for it. Secondly, I want to mention uh, Strathclyde Pension Fund, uh, a recent CLES report described public sector pensions as reservoirs of local wealth because they are generated from the contributions of those living and working in our communities. And yet those funds are predominantly used to invest in financial markets. Uh, this week I met with uh, an official of uh, Strathclyde Pension Fund and I challenged them on a number of things, including the investments the fund has made from their so-called direct investment fund. I specifically asked them about the only two investments by the fund that they could point to in North Ayrshire. One being an investment made in the SNP government's NPD PFI contract for the Largs Campus School. An investment made by a hedge fund called Equitix in which Strathclyde Pension Fund invested in. 
And the second being the Adrosan Wind Farm, which is apparently wholly owned by the JP Morgan Infrastructure Fund, in which Strathclyde Pension Fund have invested £500 million. So when I asked the official to explain how those investments were direct local investment, his response was basically, we don't do direct investments, they're too labour intensive for the, uh, the fund to manage, and our strategy is basically to delegate big amounts of money to global fund managers such as JP Morgan, and they can provide a financial return to the fund. And in my opinion, that's just not good enough. Uh, and I intend to challenge that nonsense very strongly in the coming weeks and months. I'm going to argue for a strategy that uses those reservoir of local wealth to improve the economy where the fund's members live and work, providing benefits to them, their families and their community through their work and life. So I'm very, very conscious of time now and I hope uh, what I've said is just given a quick brief snapshot of our work in North Ayrshire uh, and how we're putting community wealth building into practice. I think we've been on this journey for about two years, but we're still very much at the early stages. We are being supported by an incredible panel of experts, of which Ros is one, who I think are going to challenge our thinking uh, as we progress through this journey, and I'm sure they will help us achieve our really ambitious plan to completely reorganise the local and regional economy of Ayrshire. And I do want to finish by saying I do want to see the changes, uh, these changes happen across Scotland. I want to see us build community wealth across the country. But I hope, as I said at the start, you will join me in holding to account anyone who says that they're going to do community wealth building, but they do actually not do the, the, the whole concept justice. Because I think we do have a better future to design and then win. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I was going to circle back to that point about being very specific what we mean by and what it isn't. And I think there is that real risk of it being a a buzzword there's that and the green new deal and as we go into this next electoral cycle we need to be very specific about what it is and it isn't so thank you very much and and it was really great to hear about all of that ambition it was <laughs> really refreshing um, which is really nice so i'll hand over to ros now um there you go, ros. thank you very much and uh I just want to say, I hope you'll all agree with me, uh, that it's really, really inspirational to hear the, the sort of things that Joe's talking about um, and how, you know, even with the, the relatively uh, small amount of power uh, of only having one local authority, if you like, uh, that, that really, really groundbreaking things can be achieved if you're just prepared to look at things a bit differently and think them through a bit differently. and. You know, just the way that he's he's following the money, he's he's working out whether you know all of the budgets and all of the different areas where the council has influence, ownership, levers uh, that they can move, that they can, you know, that they're really looking at that as Joe said through a lens of is this actually doing our community good or is it not? And I think uh, it's those sorts of values that we need to take and we need to transpose across Scotland. So I'd like to just uh, start by thanking uh, the organisers for inviting me along here today. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, North Ayrshire Council for undertaking uh, the initiative that they have. The reason uh, that I was very, very happy to join the expert panel um, and I don't normally, uh, normally at the STUC, you wouldn't normally get involved with something that only is around a particular area. But this was so groundbreaking and so inspirational and exciting to us at the STUC that we really wanted to get involved, uh, give it all of our support, because we really would like to see uh, what can be achieved, what lessons can be learned, and see what we can do to try and help uh, leave and more funding uh, towards initiatives like this. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree with me that these are, you know, extremely challenging times and that we have an economy to go out and rebuild uh, whenever we get to the, the other end of, uh, co you know, the, the COVID crisis that we're facing and also uh, start to define what the, the, the new normal is going to look like. And uh, I think that this initiative couldn't have come at a better time because it's the values of community wealth building that we actually really need to take into rebuilding our economy. And it shouldn't be just about the bottom line and uh, 
you know, what profits we can make and what our GDP looks like as a country. It should be questions and values that we need to re-examine around people's quality of life, around how people are valued, around which jobs are most important because they actually care for our communities and, you know, how we measure success should be counted in you know, particularly at the moment, how many jobs are being created for people and what quality those jobs are. And so this is uh, going to be something that if we can even, and I'm sure they will make a considerable amount of difference because they are using some considerable levers at their disposal. And when we start to be able to show what a difference can be made, I think it's going to help us build up a body of evidence that others will follow. Uh, and we will see progress being made. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, North Ayrshire also for inviting the STUC to be part of this because I do think that it's really, really important that they saw the need to have workers' uh, voices represented uh, within their initiative. Uh, and that was something that we really appreciated because at the end of the day, community wealth building is about empowerment and it's about empowerment of citizens uh, in their communities, but also a key part of that is about empowering people in their local workplaces. And there can be no better way of doing that effectively uh, and of allowing workers to come together and have a strong voice and get a better deal at work and better paying conditions uh, than uh, enabling workers to become organised and unionised. And so, we were, we've been very interested in the concepts around community wealth building, but also want to make sure that, you know, when we talk about fair work, eh, you know, it's, it's not just a simple matter of, oh, we've got the living wage and so many employers tick, that's, that's the job done. There is so much more to it than that if we're going to be serious about, you know, truly giving people a voice and democratising workplaces um, and really enshrining that as, as part of how we move forward. Um, and I think that does link into the work being done around workers' cooperatives and all of that sort of thing. But, you know, just that, that principle of uh, trade unionism, which is democracy in the workplace and giving people a voice uh, at the bottom level and, and, and enabling that voice to come through and influence how work is organised, services are delivered, uh, you know, is a very important concept, I think, uh, to have at the heart of that programme. So for us, it's not just about having the seat at the, the high level table. And I'm always very nervous about being called an expert in anything because, you know, part of the reason we are there is to learn as much as it is to give our, our perspective. Uh, but, you know, it's actually about making sure that uh, when we look at how jobs are created, when we look at how workplaces are developed, that we're making sure that workers are getting a chance to unionise on the ground. So I'm very, very interested about what's going to happen on the ground in North Ayrshire. Um, and, you know, part of this I see uh, being about the conditionality of any kind of public sector funding that's given to make sure that you're really closely monitoring what do we mean by fair work. And part of that is about you know, wherever uh, public money is given to a new business startup or a, a private sector employer, that we're making sure that the local union offices are alerted that this business is here, that we're making sure the local trade unions in the area are aware that there's going to be a new wing built in this college or, uh, you know, there'll be new jobs in this hospital or this is a new service that's going to be created. So we can send an organiser down to talk to the workforce to make sure that they, they get themselves unionised um, and, you know, actually create that level of organisation on the ground. Uh, so that's going to be a very important part of it. And the reason that that's a very important part of it is not just because we want to get lots of people into trade union membership, although we unashamedly do, but because trade unions make a huge difference to people's ability to get better pay, to have safer workplaces, and to have more secure work. Uh, all the research shows that if you're in a unionised workplace, you're more likely to have a better share of the profits that your employer is making uh, and, and a better say uh, in, in, in how your work is organised. So what I thought I would try and do uh, with, with the limited time available is really just try and uh, 
look at things through the lens uh, that, that, that Grace set out for us very well, the principles uh, of community wealth building uh, from a trade union perspective and just maybe mention a few examples. And I think, uh, you know, the first uh, area that, that Grace talked about was the principle about ownership uh, within the economy. And I think that is, you know, one of the most important areas. And certainly uh, from our point of view, you know, if we are going to take the principles of community wealth building and really make them happen, we are going to have to start not being afraid of the concept of municipal or public ownership of key services. You know, if we're going to create a green economy, it cannot be left to the market to do that. The free market is not going to be able to create jobs in a strategic way. It's not going to be able to create the sustainable jobs of the future because they're really just interested in sucking out the profit eh, and not pushing in the profit. So if we're going to create that type of environment, we're going to have to start talking about uh, you know, state ownership, municipal ownership, and about massive investment. Uh, I was I was watching the Scottish government's program for government last week, and all the noises and the and the buzz phrases were there, and uh, you know you couldn't fault them. Uh, talking about ambition, talking about high quality jobs, talking about low carbon, green future economy, but when you actually look at the numbers and the investment that's that's been put in. Uh, it's, it's not going to touch the surface of what we need to be doing and we really need to be making sure that we actually own our energy infrastructures uh, and are, you know they're privately owned by businesses that are, are largely foreign uh, investors in our country that have no stake in, in our future. Uh, we, you know, we need to think about our transport infrastructure, our rail infrastructure, how are they owned. Uh, these things need to be nationalised. The one uh, light was the, the announcement about the nationalised care service or the aspiration. It wasn't exactly a definite announcement, but um, you know, these, these are the things that we need to actually think about taking into national ownership. Uh, thinking about broadband uh, and you, you know, the STUC is also calling for a national construction company because, you know, We've, we've seen what happened with companies like Carillion and the profits that were creamed uh, out while workers and services were left uh, completely destitute and people's pensions were, were completely killed off while directors uh, laughed all the way to the bank. We cannot have uh, that being the basis of how we build community wealth. So we need to be serious and have a serious conversation going forward about the state having a stake in our important services and important infrastructure as a starting point. And the other thing that if we're going to enable local authorities and inspiring leaders like Joe to be able to do the job they want to do without their hands tied behind their back is we're going to have to properly fund local government. And that means enabling local government not only to have serious funding to put in serious economic stimulus and investment into local communities but also enabling them to have borrowing powers and you know there's a step process here at the moment my preference is that we need the investment to be given by the UK government because they'll get the cheapest borrowing rates but they should be willing to hand over that money to the Scottish government to carry out a programme without undermining devolution and without the internal market bill that they were talking about this week but in a a way that empowers that government to carry out the programme for government they were elected to undertake and that should then be devolved down into local authorities to be able to then take take forward a programme that they've been elected to undertake uh, at a community level and give people a real say in how money's spent. We are a million miles from that model but that is where we need to get to to enable the, the sort of initiatives if we're really serious about rebuilding our economy from the bottom up based on people and values uh, that, that matter to real people then that's that's the sort of conversations that we need to be having uh, and educating people about, uh, about how these things could work because it could be done this way, things could be done differently. Uh, instead, what we've had is generations of foreign investment uh, where big companies, and it was good to hear Grace mentioning Amazon because in some ways it is the perfect example. Uh, you know, 
7,000 new workers will be taken on in Britain by Amazon. Uh, they're doing very well in this current economic climate um, and, and those workers will be on poverty wages. They will not be allowed access to trade unions and uh, Amazon meanwhile pays 2% tax on their £14 billion profits um, and you know that is not reinvesting in, in back into the community and the economy and it's our own governments it's the uk and the scottish government that are subsidizing companies like amazon eh, that are you know prepared to give all sorts of tax rebates and and stimulus to them to encourage them to come in and give us jobs and we've seen it happen a million times before we get foreign companies coming in we have okay jobs for a wee while and the workforce don't feel empowered to try and push push up their their paying conditions uh, in any way, shape or form because they're worried that the jobs will simply get moved to a different part of the world. So we can't really go on in this way. We have to find a different way of doing things that actually empowers people to take a share of the profits uh, that, that they absolutely deserve for the hard work that they do. Um, and, you know, all of the all of the research shows that if you pay low paid workers money and you put the money into workers pockets they will spend that money in their local economy on local businesses and again that's maybe where we have a bit of a a bit of you know an opportunity as well as a challenge going forward because i've got no doubt that we won't see everybody going back to work there will be a more blended model of home working but i actually think that could be really good for local communities and local towns because they'll be going to deal yes daily for their lunch instead of going to pre or or Starbucks for their lunch in the middle of a big city. So, you know, you, there's, a, there's a real opportunity here for more localised spending habits that actually support local communities and smaller businesses. Uh, and, you know, these are things that we need to grasp a hold of uh, at this moment in time as well. So, so there's that side of things. Um, there's also the, the fair employment side of things and uh, you know, I think I've covered uh, what we mean by uh, high quality jobs and giving trade unionists a voice and, and, and all of the myriad of ways that trade unions can help create a fairer um, employment model. But I would also like to just touch on uh, the whole just transition debate in this uh, and, you know, make it very clear that we do need uh, local skills to be developed when we have initiatives. You know, the Aberdeen Bypass, for example, was a huge uh, initiative that the government put a lot of money into um, to, to build that road. Most of the workforce did not come from the local area. Most of the workforce, 80% uh, of the workforce uh, came from out with the local area. Uh, now, think what a difference that could have made if, if at the point at which planning was even first talked about that they started training up local young people to be able to have the skills to do the jobs to help build that bypass you know there's not a joined up approach to skills to making sure that local workforces are supported and at the moment we don't have a just transition in scotland what we have is an unjust transition we've got cs wind one of the only wind uh, wind manufacturing companies that build uh, turbine towers in the UK uh, and it's been asset stripped at the same time as the Scottish government's putting wind wells up you know everywhere it can find a spare patch of land on and offshore uh, we've got Bifab where the workers are having to go home and look at their window at a huge wind farm being built on the sea right next to where their plant is and the, the, the jackets for those windmills have been manufactured in Indonesia rather than where they could be building them in the local yard. You know, this is an absolute travesty. Uh, they were not prepared to intervene uh, and make sure that local supply chains and manufacturing jobs can be created uh, on the back of this green revolution that the government keeps telling us that we're so far ahead with. So, you know, these are the sorts of uh, areas where I think it's important when we're talking about just employment practices that we're actually making sure that we measure success in terms of jobs and sustainability in that respect and, and the greater good that we're bringing into our economy every time we spend money uh, and we're not doing it at the moment in a, in a joined up way. 
And I suppose that on the last point from a worker's point of view, when we talk about who owns the land, who owns the property, uh, you only have to look from the point of view of young workers uh, at the moment. And it's a big issue uh, that the STUC is working with organisations like Live and Rent on. Uh, you know, the explosion of the private rental sector in, in the UK um, and in Scotland is, is huge. Uh, young people are caught in a poverty trap because they are often in very precarious forms of employment uh, and they are often in high, high priced private rental accommodation. There is not enough social housing and there is not an easy way. You know, that maybe wasn't so much of a problem 20 years ago when you could get a, a, a really cheap mortgage um, and also you didn't need a deposit. But now that is a big problem because young people don't have the ability to save up for that deposit. So we do need to think about more progressive policies. Uh, you know, we also have right now an explosion of people buying rural housing in Scotland. Uh, and if you look at local authority areas like Argyll and Butte, they're finding it very hard to fill posts for social workers. Uh, because not because people don't want the work or don't want to live in that area because it's a beautiful area to live in but they can't get the housing so you know they can't actually afford to live in that area because they can't uh, afford to access the housing so you know maybe we should be looking at tax and second home owners uh, and setting up funds to allow local people to have deposits for housing uh, building more social housing uh, you know, really thinking about a range of, uh, you know, grants for local key workers uh, to be able to get deposits to, to buy a house, enabling them to be at this, this, the start of the queue, maybe when they're putting in offers. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of good quick fixes, if you were imaginative about it, that you could be thinking about. But, you know, we also need to think about just that level of rebalancing the economy so that local people actually are seen as the whole person. Uh, and, you know, it is about investing in that quality of life, investing in sustainability. Um, a, 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 a number of things like that done together really could uh, make Scotland so much more uh, fairer uh, for all of us. So for me and for, for trade unionists, these are the benefits of, of community wealth building. And this is why we are 100% behind it and will continue to argue for policies uh, at a Scottish level that will enable us to, to try our best to rebuild an economy that's built on these values. And I commend the work being done by North Ayrshire and I wish Joe and all of his team uh, every, every you know, luck and success with it. Uh, and we'll be 100% behind you in trying to take that forward and push some of these levers to try and make it happen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rose. that was fantastic. Um, and thanks to the whole panel, that was really, a uh, really interesting set of um, contributions. I think they all worked really well together and covered different areas, but were really complementary. Um, we're going to go to questions now. Uh, people have already been putting questions in the chat um, function. If, if people want to ask more questions, they can. Um, try and keep them shortish if you can. Uh, we've already got kind of a bunch, so we'll get through as much as we can. Um, but apologies if we don't get through to everything. Um, so the first question, and I think um, what I'm going to have to do is um, kind of point, uh, suggest people to talk as the, um, the administrator, the admin can only unmute one person at a time. So I'll kind of pick panelists and if you, if you don't want to, if you don't want to speak, you know, pass on. Um, but the, the, first, um, <laughs> the first question is about, um, is about, um, from Nick, what about best value legislation favoring market fundamentalism and big external suppliers maybe abroad? So I think, how, how does that kind of legislation fit in with attempts to, you know, the kind of priorities to try to build into community wealth building? Um, start with Joe on that one, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, the, the constraints is that we're still operating within the procurement regulations uh, with community wealth building. There's no attempt to try and circumvent what's uh, the, the law basically. Uh, what, we, what we are trying to do uh, with procurement uh, is, is basically make our business base more competitive and we're doing that through two different sort of processes. First of all, we've changed the way that we do what we call quick quotes. So that's the uh, 
smaller contracts which are below the threshold for fully uh, competitive tendering. And we've got a new approach where our business team look at the local market and try and make sure that we have businesses who are able to supply those goods and services uh, for those quick quotes. The second is that procurement shouldn't just be seen as a sort of technocratic process where you put a, a contract out in a portal, you get uh, bids coming in and then you score them and say, well, actually that person uh, scored highest and therefore you need to give it to them. There's a step before that that we need to see it as, and it's about seeing procurement as a tool of economic development and the power of it as a tool, and that is the business support. So we're starting to look at a longer planning of procurement uh, for those bigger contracts. And fundamentally, our business team are out there looking at the current market, looking at local supply chains. Is there anybody that is able to supply that? And are they able to prepare and become competitive to win the contract? If there isn't somebody there, then that's where, as you go down this journey, you start to think about, could you create that? Could you create it through a collaboration of local businesses or could you set up and establish a worker owned business, a cooperative, a social enterprise that could actually facilitate and provide that good or service. And I think that's fundamentally what's been happening in other areas that have done community wealth building. So Matthew Brown and Preston's looking at worker owned cooperatives, setting up 10 uh, as a starting point. And actually where community wealth building started in Cleveland, they looked at the public procurement side of things done a lot of good stuff in terms of local supply chains there, but then established what's called the Evergreen Cooperatives. And it's free worker-owned cooperatives that's part of the bigger network. And one of them, for example, was a laundry service. There was no laundry service situated within the city of Cleveland. So they've set up a worker-owned laundry service. And that worker-owned laundry service over the last few years has bet Sodexo to the big laundry contract for the health institution within the city. So now you've got worker-owned uh, laundry services providing that massive contract within the city rather than it going to Sodexo. And I think that fundamentally is what we're talking about when we're talking about community wealth building. It's not about North Ayrshire competing with East Ayrshire or South Ayrshire or indeed Inverclyde or Renfrewshire. It's North Ayrshire businesses competing with the big multinationals and stopping the public wealth that we have at our disposal being extracted by them and gone to other places, making sure that we use it to actually reorganise the local and regional economy as Grace uh, spoke about. Finally, very quickly, we are leaving the European Union. Uh, we know that that's going to be challenging for the economy and there's going to be a lot of things uh, that might impact on the economy. But the one area I think where we need to be looking at the opportunities is procurement. We can no longer uh, just say, well, we can't provide the living wage as a requirement of public contracts because of EU uh, regulations. We're going to be outside the European Union. We now need to be looking at how we reform procurement regulations. And Clays and the Democracy Collaborative have been speaking about uh, installing a social licence to operate in which if you want to win a public contract, then you need a social license which commits you to the living wage, good terms and conditions, guaranteed hours, uh, make sure that you provide social and environmental benefits as part of that contract, etc. That's what we need to be looking at over the next few years. If the Scottish Government are very serious about taking community wealth building forward, and I do question whether or not they are, but if they are serious about it, then when we leave the European Union, let's see if we get that type of reform to procurement, because that's the facilitator, that's the enabler that we need to make this happen in the country. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think actually maybe it's rather than me asking each person in turn, maybe it's if, um, if the three of you want to indicate at me if you want to speak on a particular question. So either by just kind of, you know, put your hand up or um, either physically or by one of the tools. So Grace or Ros, do you have anything to add on that particular question? Or you want to move on. Yeah. Uh, Ros, thanks. Uh, on the social license, um, I think that's an excellent idea and I think it's a good example of in devolved Scotland, if we want to start making a difference, I mean the STUC actually supports the devolvement of employment law uh, to Scottish level 
Uh, but if we want to make a difference, we have to start uh, thinking about, you know, what powers does Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government have, and how can we force them to use them? And I think jo Joe's absolutely right. That would be that sort of licensing approach would be a really creative way of doing it. One of the interesting things about the whole coronavirus situation is we've been really able to see how far the Scottish Government's been able to take the fact you know, to, to put in rules based on, uh, that have affected workplaces quite markedly based on the fact that it's a public health issue and public health has devolved. So it's, it's I'm hoping that this is a, a kind of direction of travel that we can push them further on is coming up with different ways. You know, they they say that they're committed to being a fair work world leader by 2025. Now 2025 is not that long away and as I keep saying to them they're going to have to do some serious leverage about all of their public funding to make sure that they use that uh, to make sure employers bring in good employment practices and that includes access for trade unions so it's going to be interesting to see you know what they come up with but that's exactly the sort of thing we could be using. Thanks Roz. Um... I think we'll move on to the next question, unless Grace wanted to. Okay. Um, so the next question is from James, who's the uh, d deputy leader of the Labour Group on Cornwall Council. That uh, I'll just read out. We're a small minority group within the council, but the management move a community wealth building procurement motion with a lot of cross party support. I think of it as buying Cornish and supporting Cornish business. Um, but of course, I want to go a lot deeper than that. Our officers seem to get it, even if many councillors don't. We're looking at a percentage SV and, and climate change target for our procurement. On the other side of the coin, council trying to sell, trying to use homework and sell off many buildings. Uh, had contact with Claire's. Within a non-Labour council, what measures do you suggest that I push the hardest with my window of goodwill in the small time I have before elections? Uh, who would like to um, respond to that? If, <laughs> go on, Joe. <laughs> I suppose I, I, I should answer the political question, eh? But, I mean, fundamentally, I think if anybody in local government was going to do community wealth building, then there needs to be political leadership to make it happen. If we leave it just to the officials and the officers and, and, and the, the local civil servants, if you like, then it won't be done to the level and extent that we as socialists want to see happen. Uh, so it's good to hear that in opposition, Labour groups are thinking about how they can advance this. I think you've started in the right place with procurement because even Conservative councils will be attracted by the idea of spending local and supporting local businesses. So I think you've, you've therefore got a, a, a foot in the door. It may well be, however, that I think you need to just start planting some seeds around the other pillars and start to build your campaign and think about how you engage with the community ahead of elections around what is the potential of a community wealth building uh, approach for your own area. You can absolutely use the example of you've started on procurement, but then identify those bits of land, those bits of uh, empty building, derelict buildings that are actually lying there. And you could say, as an example, well, if you're the Labour Council, then here's a bit of land that we could transfer to a, a community ownership, we could set up a cooperative, here's a building that we could transfer and we could regenerate our towns uh, in that type of uh, uh, way. So I think you've, you've planted the seed. I'm not sure how you take it forward, but you do need to get that political leadership and I would start to just campaign and plant the seeds on the other pillars uh, and start making the, the argument in the case before your next election. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Grace or Roz, do you want to come in on that, or should we move, we'll move on? Thanks very much. Sorry, I might make some of the questions a little bit more succinct, just so we can get through a bit more, but I mean, it's, the questions basically says that um, welcomes a lot of what's been said here, and, and obviously very positive about it, but the question is about co-op, cooperative organisations, whilst they're better in terms of quality and workers' rights, they still have to compete within the wider economy, can they genuinely flourish without large subsidy when going up against leaner, cheaper options? Will they be forced into making their own cutbacks in order to compete? Um, who would like to... Uh, Grace, do you want to start on that Yeah, one? I can go on that, I think. Um, I think that that's what's so important about social value in these anchor institutions, particularly public sector anchor institutions, 
you know, their, their main motivation isn't profit and doesn't have to be the cheapest possible price. These are organisations that are meant to serve the populations in which they're based. So these are the types of organisations that should be having, um, you know, social value that's based on um, improving like benefits for that place rather than just the cheapest possible one. So I think that's what a, a, why the community wealth building approach really offers so much for these types of cooperative organisations because it's th through working with these large um, anchor institutions that they can actually get a foothold and sort of expand as a business. Um, that's a very succinct answer. I don't know if Joe or Ross want to chip in. Thanks, that's great. Uh, Ros? Yeah, just to, just to say that it is absolutely about how do you define value um, and, and how do you value things and, you know, we're going to have to have completely different procurement systems at the moment and social care. Uh, different local authorities across Scotland have completely different systems of how they uh, add up the, the bidding uh, for different contracts. I think social care is a great example of everything that's wrong uh, with our current procurement systems in some ways. Um, but when you actually look at the amount of value they give, it's, it's usually somewhere between 5% and 20% that they give to uh, employment practice and, the, and that side of things of the bid. You know, in, in no in no case is it, you know, is it a, a sort of substantial or significant amount, uh, and some are far more than others. Uh, and in nearly all cases, it's all about the, the bottom line. Um, and then you've obviously got the issues that are also very important about the quality of the delivery of the service as well, that should be way up there alongside the, you know, the two are absolutely interlinked. You cannot treat workers badly and expect a service to be of a high standard and, you know, it just can't happen. So, you know, we're going to have to just admit to ourselves that these things do cost money and be realistic about how much money needs to be invested to deliver good services. Um, but one thing I'm clear about is that if you're not paying money to shareholders, uh, you know, let's get rid of the, pro the for-profit element in a lot of these services, uh, and then we'll actually find it not that difficult. But let's be really clear about the minimum standards we require in terms of quality of service and quality of employment uh, when, we are, when we're out there contracting and procuring. Thanks very much. Um, so the next, the next question, there was actually two parts to this. The, the first was um, so a technical question. How would setting up a community land trust work with Scottish property landlords, land laws rather? I'm interested in comparison to the English laws. I think there was a bit of response in the chat, but if anyone had um, something to say about that as well, that'd be interesting. And a kind of follow-up question from Alexa as well would, was just to say that it'd be great to hear more about the municipal renewable energy company that Joe was talking about. So I guess we'll come to Joe last maybe because he's probably got the most to say on the on the energy company. Um, but I don't know if, if either Grace or Ross has anything to say on that specific question of, um, which is quite technical about the community land. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certain land laws, so I would, you know, we'd need to get advice about how best to do these things. Yeah, um, I'm also not an expert, um, but I know that the Scottish Land Commission have released some interesting work um, around common good land, um, which might be of use, but yeah, I'm also not an expert in land law, sorry. I know that someone did post in the, in the chat, with, so hopefully that's helped with that, but we'll uh, go to Joe. Yeah, thanks. I mean, again, I probably don't have the level of expertise to give sort of clear guidance on uh, setting up a community land trust. I do know that it is possible uh, and it's something that has been discussed as a sort of particular model within community wealth building for some areas. And you can see how well, community wealth building will be different in every area, obviously, different challenges in different uh, areas of the country. And you can see how a land trust, for example, makes complete sense for cities like Edinburgh that have the whole issue of land ownership and then the price of land and all that uh, effect on housing etc so having something that holds that land within some sort of common trust uh, in terms of protecting it uh, for the common good probably makes sense in the type of uh, areas. 
In terms of the municipal generation stuff I spoke about earlier on, at this moment in time, we're not incubating it within a, a business, a, a, a municipally owned business. It's just a council project. So it'll be on council owned land, the income stream will come back to the council and we can decide on how we then reinvest that money uh, going, going forward. I have to say, it, it sounds like a, a, an interesting idea to do it through, through a business, uh, through a kind of municipal enterprise. And I've got to say that that then links me into what kind of has been discussed at a Scottish level, level with this idea of a Scottish energy company. And at the minute, I mean, I've got to say that again, that the ambition of the Scottish government seems to be that they're going to start with a white label product, which is actually not a, a company at all, but it's actually procuring the energy from another company and then offering it out eh, to local government or, 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 or others eh, through that. I think they need to raise their ambition on that. It needs to be a fully licensed energy company, which is involved not just in the kind of retail and consumer part of it, but actually in the generation. So Roz was talking earlier on about the just transition and how that's working out in terms of employment and ownership and uh, everything else. I saw a publicly owned energy company involved in uh, upstream and downstream energy actually is the key to, I think, democratising and making sure that the, the green transition and the green uh, revolution actually works for workers and works for us as citizens of this country. So I think the Scottish Government uh, have to raise their game on that. If they just go for a white label product uh, and, and are involved in the retail side of the energy market, then that is not the level of ambition that I think that a lot of us on this call would like to see in terms of an intervention in the energy market. Thanks. Um, so we have a question from Ian, which is, um, what is the minimum political, economic, geographical area a community wealth building model needs to work, e.g. unitary city, local authority, or a county council versus district, parish, council level? I don't know if anyone has um, a view on that in terms of what's the best scale or, or the minimum necessary scale. I think... Yeah, I think for me, it's it's a set of principles that can be applied to all scales, you know, so you could be talking about a small part of a very small island, you know, one village that's got 50 people in it, or you could be talking about a, 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 a local authority like Joe's, or you could be talking about the principles upon which, you know, the whole of Scotland or the whole of the UK works, but it is about devolving decision making and budgets to the lowest possible level uh, and you know really uh, trying to empower and enable people to 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 make you know to own the decisions over how how that is that money spent um, and you know to trust that that's going to get you a good outcome which it will because it'll be it'll be what the people need um, so you know that's that's one side of it and I think just that idea of of making sure that you've got the right value system about what different, you know, what is the impact? Is this, you know, initiative, is giving this company a tax break or investment or support going to suck wealth out of the community or is it going to push wealth into the community? And that's the, the big question to keep asking again and again. Thanks. Uh, Grace, did you, were you wanting to come in on uh, yeah, I suppose just to reiterate what Ros just said, that it can be done on any of those levels. Um, but I think something really key is that it can be done with cooperation of those levels as well. So, for example, in Preston, it was the local authority, like the city level, that was really progressing community wealth building. But that had much wider impacts in the wider Lancashire County Council as well. Um, and also city regions can collaborate on this. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I think it's it can really vary. Thanks. Joe, did you have anything on that? Or should we, yeah. Yeah, just to kind of reiterate what Grace just said. So in North Ayrshire, it very much is the council. I think I said this in my talk that's driving it politically and uh, operationally, but uh, we are working with anchors across the whole Ayrshire. Uh, and now we are starting to get uh, some partnership working with East and South Ayrshire Council as well. So it is scalable. And I think if we want to realise the potential of 
community wealth building for a region like Ayrshire, then that sort of collaboration across the three Ayrshire local authorities and the other Ayrshire-wide institu anchor institutions like the health board, the college, etc., will be fundamental, uh, but very much driven by the, the sort of ambitions uh, and the politics of uh, my administration in, in North Ayrshire. Brilliant, thank you. Um, the next question I'm probably going to read out because I might find it difficult to sum up, but <clears throat> so it, it's from Dora. It's can local government be reconfigured to encompass the embryonic proto-socialist mutual aid formations, transcending representational democracy, and embracing more horizontalist, direct forms of resident participation, prefiguring another way of being, living, social relationships. What is the intersection? both conceptual and practical between mutual aid groups and reenactment of Labour's alternative models of economic ownership, community wealth building, regenerative circular slow growth economics, promoting development of co-ops through educational initiatives, co-op networks, and values of solidarity, cooperation, interconnection, human empathy. So I hope I'm not doing, kind of reducing the question, but the way I read that is to say, I suppose, yeah, to what extent is community wealth building moving us towards a more horizontal form of kind of participant um, residents kind of participating kind of almost you know almost more direct democracy type um, things and also how does it kind of link into those broader values of solidarity uh, cooperation and so on I hope that I hope that's not um, simplifying it <laughs> do you, do you do you want to go for that then? I'll, I'll, I'll take this one first. I suppose for, for my uh, ambition in, in, in North Ayrshire, it very much aligns with probably everything that was said within that, that question. Uh, so when we launched the Community Wealth Building uh, Strategy, I kind of reframed my, my whole cabinet uh, and took on the Community Wealth Building uh, sort of portfolio myself, but I also created... Uh, sort of two other uh, new posts, one of which is looking at sort of Green New Deal sustainability stuff and how uh, once we get through, like we're going to invest in that project, how do we make sure the design of that project is low carbon? How do we make sure that our uh, policies in terms of ground maintenance and uh, stuff like that's uh, low carbon? How do we make sure that when we're looking at building co uh, council houses, we're doing it uh, by the, using the, the latest technology to make the houses sustainable. How do we instigate a sort of retrofitting programme? So that very much aligns with my role as community wealth building. It just kind of goes downstream a wee bit. And the other one was a post for participative democracy. Uh, and that is looking at how we open up the structures of the council and make it less bureaucratic and really build on, I think, the response to COVID and the relationship that's probably built up between community and the local state through the way that we uh, responded with food and community hubs and support for, for prescriptions, etc. during the lockdown. It seems to me to be, and it, it seems the wrong word to use in this sort of context at the end of a global pandemic, but it seems to me the best opportunity that local governments probably had for quite a while to reset the relationship between us and communities and make it less adversarial and make it more of a partnership. And if you think about the context of community wealth building, you can't do well, the community wealth building without the community bit, it comes first. And therefore, how do you do plural ownership, land and assets, et cetera, without a community group or a, to set up a cooperative or set up a social enterprise and be more commercial in its activities? So it's fundamental to that. But I think in North Air, so just to, just to kind of fin finish, we start from a decent base in terms of participatory democracy. I mentioned, uh, I think, in the, the, the speech, the uh, locality partnerships that we have in North Ayrshire. One of the things I did uh, quite early on was I set up a community investment fund, uh, took some underspend for capital budgets, created a fund, and then delegated responsibility for that fund to the locality partnerships. The locality partnerships are made up of elected members from a local area, but also community reps. And they've been involved in sort of looking at projects to take forward supported by the fund. A lot of it has been about taking ownership of land and assets. Uh, and for example, there's one uh, sort of project in the island of Cumbria where it's looking at restoring the Millport Town Hall, transferring ownership to the community group, and then they get the funding helped by the Community Investment Fund to, to, to restore it. 
So I think we've 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 done that, which has been good, and there's plenty of examples on the ground now of that working. We've uh, done participatory uh, budgeting, but not just through dishing out some small grants. Again, I think in Scotland, we use participatory budgeting to talk about this sort of new open government sort of participatory democracy model. But we talk about Porto Alegre in Brazil as an example. In Porto Alegre in Brazil, they wanted it to be the way to negotiate with this, uh, with capital. They wanted it to use it as an economic tool to change the economy. And what we are doing in Scotland at the minute is we're saying, right, here's £50,000, everybody pile into a library or a college or that and vote for what project gets a couple of thousand pounds. That's not participatory democracy. That's us just looking at how we get some people in a room to decide how we divvy up existing funds. What we did with participatory budgeting was we said, right, that's fine, we'll do the grants, but what we're going to do is we're going to open up a, a mainstream budget to participatory budgeting approaches. So our ground maintenance budget in North Ayrshire was opened up to a process of uh, participation and over 600 people across North Ayrshire participated in deciding how that budget was spent in their own local area. Did they want the grass cut as much? Did they want to plant uh, sort of fruit and veg rather than flowers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and it just got a level of engagement, including with the workers, I have to say, and their communities, which was brilliant. And the third example I'm going to give is we are going through the process at the minute of uh, demolishing our set of high-rise flats in Irvine. We have two sets of high-rise flats in uh, North Ayrshire, one in Irvine and one in Salkitts. And in response to Grenfell, we said we were going to install fire uh, sprinklers into both of those uh, buildings. And uh, as we walked through the programme of works that would be required, we decided there might be a bigger transformational project here that, that might come out of that, and that might be demolishing the existing buildings and replacing them with modern council houses. But because it's people's homes, we didn't just make that decision on their behalf. I actually opened it up to a vote of the residents, whether they owned the property or whether they were uh, council tenants, to decide the future of their buildings. And in Sulkits, they decided, with nice views looking onto the Isle of Arran, that they wanted to retain uh, the property and they're getting an, in, an enhanced investment programme to uh, install the sprinklers, etc. But in Irvine, they decided to uh, demolish and replace. And that was a process of absolute participatory democracy where the, the council wasn't saying, we know best on your home and what we're going to do is we're going to knock it down, flatten it and give you a new house. We said, do you want that? You will make the decision. And I was open at the start, whatever decision you make, I'll, I'll, I'll follow and I'll put into uh, implementation. And I've been true to my word. So in Irvine, it's getting demolished and replaced. In Salk, it's the investment programme started. So I think building on that type of stuff, building on the response to COVID, I think local government has the best position possible to rebuild trust in politics by improving the relationship by, uh, between the council and community. And that's absolutely what I want to do and then for that to filter through into community wealth building to really support what our, our ambitions uh, on this. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, Grace, Roz, did you want to come back on that question? Or, or should, yeah, Grace? Yeah, um, I suppose to give more of a sort of conceptual answer to that, I think definitely yes, local government can be reconfigured to sort of encompass those um, like represent, representational forms. I think if we look more globally to the new municipalist movement, um, that's sort of happening all across Europe where activists have retaken city halls in places like Barcelona and others um, and have completely changed the way that local government functions. So they crowdsourced, to, they crowdsourced their manifesto, um, they held like sort of weekly um, like citizens meetings, etc. And they've completely sort of sought to change how local government functions in Barcelona. Um, and I suppose that's what was so exciting about Joe's answer just there, is that it, it is happening here too. We can, and people are happening. You know, this, the other future is sort of possible. Um, and it, yeah, it's really exciting to hear that in places in Scotland, like it is beginning to happen. Thanks. Um, Okay, I think for the last, we're probably going to do about four more minutes on questions. We might try and just do one person per question so we can get through a few. I mean, we're not going to get through all of them by any uh, means, but um, 
So there was a kind of specific question about whether how these ideas could align with the common wheel vision of our common home plan stroke Green New Deal um, and the resilient economy idea. So, I mean, that depends, that basically means, are any, are any of you familiar with that uh, common wheel vision? And can you speak to that? It's quite a specific question. And um, if not, that's fine. And um, hopefully somebody will be able to contribute in the chat and, and we'll move on. Um, there's a question about um, what is CLES's view of UBI. Now, no, nobody here is representing CLES as such, but I wonder if if people have, I guess, maybe a view of how UBI fits into uh, community wealth building, possibly. Do it. And, um, Joe? Do you... I'm not sure that... UBI necessarily fits within community wealth building. I think it's an idea in its own right. Uh, and I think for me in North Ayrshire, we were part of the uh, Universal Basic Income Pilot in Scotland. We were one of four local authorities that did the feasibility study. And the reason why we did that feasibility study is probably the same reasons why we're looking at community wealth building two years ago and changing the economy. And that is that the current uh, sort of so social security system just does not work for communities like us. It's been ripped up uh, from beneath people's feet. The welfare state was set up to support people at their time of need. And actually over the last 10 years, we've just seen it being used to hit the most vulnerable uh, and, and make them pay for uh, the bankers' mistakes in terms of uh, the crash in 2008. So if we're looking at how we return back to a social security system where we care about people and communities and it's about supporting people then that's why we thought that the time had come to explore whether or not basic income would have that desired uh, effect but i've got to say that we do recognize that if it's pitched at a level that's insufficient to support people then it could have a negative impact on poverty it needs to be pitched at the, the right level and it also needs to be uh, able to be, be funded and part of what we did in terms of the feasibility study was we asked the Fraser Allender uh, Institute to do a economic modelling one and they kind of focused on income tax as the sole way of funding a UBI and clearly that's not the case and we made that point to them there's a whole range of uh, tax levers that you could use to fund that uh, and there's also a uh, sort of preventative spend so there will be savings I think in terms of the NHS and public services in general if a UBI was to be introduced but I don't think it necessarily is community wealth building or UBI or that the two of them are the same they, 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 they're, they're ideas in their own right. Uh, Ros I think wanted to come in on that. Thanks I, I just wanted to say I mean we're a little bit cautious about UBI at the STUC because I think we fundamentally sort of support people's right to independently sell their labour, if you like, and, and, and earn their living by selling their, their labour eh, and having that choice to do that or withdraw that. And it's putting a lot of power, eh, you know, I think we think about it through the lens of automation and the amount of jobs that may go if we don't intervene as workers in you know, the, the direction of travel and make sure that there is meaningful skills and work uh, for people to do and that employers are not able to, you know, just automate jobs that perhaps shouldn't be automated because, again, they'll be looking at their bottom line and profits as the main indicator of that. What we do think is an interesting model, though, and it links into the coronavirus is almost a uh, in, in Germany, they have almost like a furlough scheme that they have running all the time. Uh, it wasn't new for them to introduce a, a furlough scheme in a time of economic crisis. And it means if there's a downturn in a particular industry or sector, uh, they will put those workers into furlough on their, on their typical pay and look to reskill them and redivert them into other areas of the economy. Or it may just be for a while until things pick up again. But you know, they, they are much more willing to sort of intervene at that level to support people's uh, quality of life and, and underpin the workforce in that way. So, uh, you know, that's certainly a model that we are quite interested in looking at that does link in some ways into the sort of UBI concept. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to get through all of the questions. Um, 
I think this was a really great session. I think on the left, we talk a lot about political education and the potential of political education. And I think this was a really great example of it. I've certainly learned a lot from our speakers today. And I think the quality of the questions is like testament to how good the contributions have been. So thanks to all the speakers and thanks to everybody um, that's asked questions as well. I mean, certainly from my perspective, like Grace just gives such a great and succinct and clear overview of the uh, kind of of the fundamentals of it. And I've kind of got a whole a bigger picture of it. Um, Roz kind of the elements about I think I wrote down that the free market can not create jobs in a strategic way to tackle the crisis and all of those different elements about the a national construction company is really sticking with me. And Joe, I think you just gave the perfect example that I know will be really useful about the tower blocks <laughs> and about actually the ambition. And I think that's such a really, really great example. So I just want to say Thank you to everyone. Um, and thanks to everyone in the Glasgow Transform team who helped with organizing and the World Transform team and Pam Duck and Glancy as well. Um, so in the chat, Dermot has just shared two links. Um, there's a link to a WhatsApp group. So if anybody wants to get involved with organizing more events like this, we might need to have a discussion group and um, click on in Glasgow. And um, yeah, we've had people from all over, which is really great. Um, but if you want to get involved locally in Glasgow, click on that link and you can join a WhatsApp group where you'll receive messages about our meetings. Just to say if you click on that, other people will be able to see your number. So don't click on it if you're not up for that. Secondly, really important a feedback survey and whenever we've done events like this before the surveys always really helps inform the next one so click on the link tell us what worked well what didn't what we could do differently next time and um, so thanks very much um really thanks again to the speakers we can do kind of a virtual round of applause to everyone <laughs> um and thanks very much i really appreciate it bye everyone View the full TWT20 program and become a supporter today to help us deliver political education all year round at theworldtransformed.org.